I, uh, yeah, it's, it's baby's bedtime right now. So yeah. Yeah. That is a lot. I was like, I left it to my husband for tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Um, cool. Okay. Well, I think we right are, we're right at six 30. So I am just going to get started. Love that Eliana's having her glass of wine. (laughs) Um, amazing. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today, um, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, sexual health. And today's title was a lot of fun to come up with um, because while there are many things that lube can solve, uh, I think when it comes to sex, sometimes you really have to get focused on the mechanics and thinking about libido and arousal. And we'll talk about all of that today. So I'm really excited for this incredible um, group of speakers that we have. We have Rachel and Diana from uh, Women's Care Beverly Hills and Anna McMaster from Origin. Um, I know I personally have a lot to learn and I was excited to sneak preview these slides. So i um, really excited for this conversation. So just as a quick reminder, we are recording this session and we will share it out with anyone who registered for the event afterwards. So if you have to pop out or pop in and out, um, we'll make sure you get all of the content. Um, and I know a bunch of people submitted questions in advance, which is awesome. We've shared those with the speakers. So hopefully they can address some of those but if not, um, p- please feel free to leave questions in the Q&A or in the chat, or you can DM me directly and I'll make sure that um, we get those answered. So just kind of a little bit about uh, Origin. Um, I'm Allison, first of all, I lead the marketing team here at Origin and we are physical therapy for women and mothers, but really our aspiration is a lot bigger than that. We wanna really empower women to feel strong and good and confident in their bodies at every stage of life. And so it's super important to us that this type of care and access is accessible. So um, as a quick flag, we are in network with most commercial insurance plans. Um, and Anna, who's gonna be helping lead our discussion tonight, actually just is our clinical director of our most recent clinic that we opened in West Hollywood. So um, that just opened last month, which is really exciting that we are growing and expanding. Um, so with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. So we have Dr. Anna McMaster, who is our clinical director, like I said, at Origin in West Hollywood. We have Dr. Diana Campbell, who is um, the newest OBGYN at Women's Care of Beverly Hills, and then Rachel Murray, who is a nurse practitioner at Women's Care of Beverly Hills. Um, And today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff from just understanding painful sex, kind of what's driving it, what the root causes are, how you can maximize pleasure, um, different stretches and positions to try, and then we'll leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A. And so with that, I will hand it over, I think, to either Rachel or Diana to just sort of kick off the conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. I'm so excited to be here with everyone tonight. Um, really excited to be speaking with Anna and with Dr. Campbell as well. Anna was my own public floor PT when I was pregnant yes. and postpartum. Um, and we collaborate quite often about patients. So interdisciplinary care is something that we talk about a lot in, uh, in sexual health. It's really important that we're working with Uh, specialists in different areas, pelvic floor PTs, nutritionists, gynecologists, all these areas to make sure we're all communicating and honing in to give a patient a solid experience. Um, A lot of times this is a chronic chronic issue for people and they need to feel heard. So um, to get into the crux of today, female sexual dysfunction, female sexual health is not something we're talking about enough. Um, This is something that I am incredibly passionate about Um, we are not asking enough about it at the gynecologist office. We are not asking about it enough at our primary care doctor's office. And we really want to change the game on that. The reality is that in medical school and advanced practice nursing school, we are not getting educated about this. So we have to seek out our education. We have to do additional reading. We have to do additional conferences so that we can learn how to specialize. And there are specialists around the country and around Los Angeles, um, but you do have to find them. So at Women's Care Now, we are creating a, a pelvic health clinic off of our own office. So we are an OBGYN office, but we are creating a a separate subset that's going to be focused on a lot of these issues and we're here for you. Um, But if we're too far away, um, there are other places you can look as well. 
So uh, I wanted to do a quick plug in too, just to clarify the role of the nurse practitioner versus the medical doctor, because I think some of you, Allison, you may be confused here. I don't think I had a slide on this one, but um, some of you maybe haven't heard of a nurse practitioner before, or maybe haven't seen one. Um, but generally speaking within the office, we're really doing the same work. So nurse practitioners are assessing patients, we're diagnosing patients, we're treating patients, we're prescribing medications, we're ordering labs, we're ordering tests, all of those things alongside the doctors. The big difference is that doctors are also doing surgeries and doctors are delivering babies. So at Women's Care, when Dr. Campbell joins us in August, which we're so excited to bring her on board at that time, we will have, I think, eight medical doctors in the practice uh, and then two nurse practitioners. And we're a really collaborative group um, that works closely together to make sure that patients are getting the care that they need and a really, really solid um, patient experience. So hopefully that clarifies a bit. And now to go into what we're here to talk about. So when I look at female sexual dysfunction and female sexual health, this is not a singular issue. There are various components. So when a patient comes into the office and she has a complaint, I'm not just talking to her about that specific complaint. Because if you think about it, if you're having pain, for example, it may affect other areas of sex. So when we look at sex, we look at libido, which is the desire to have sex, the desire to participate in the sexual activity. Then we look at arousal and there's two different types of arousal that we look at. We look at cognitive arousal, which is the mental interest during sex. So the pathways are very similar than those that are being stimulated during libido, but arousal is as the activity is happening. And then we look at, um, physical arousal. So that's the nipples becoming hard, the vagina becoming lubricated, blood pressure increases. All of these things are physically happening to create orgasm. And we physically, we need arousal to lead to orgasm, which is the ability to climax. And then we look at pain. So before we go into causes of pain, I'm going to have um, Anna talk about the pelvic floor anatomy, and then I'll have her hand it back to me. I'll talk about the vulva and the vagina, um, and then we'll go into the causes of different types of pain. Cool. All right. So my favorite muscles to talk about are the pelvic floor muscles. And this is a group of muscles and connective tissue that lives on the bottom of your pelvis or the floor of your pelvis. Um, you can think of it like a hammock shape that goes from the front of your pelvis, so your pubic bone, to the back of your pelvis, your sacrum. And these muscles actually do a lot of stuff for us. Um, they control urination and bowel movements, so they allow us to not leak when we're not supposed to leak, and they allow us to fully empty our bladder and bowels at the appropriate time. Um, they actually support all of the organs of the pelvis. So if you can see that picture there, we have the bladder, uterus, and the rectum. There's nothing else below them to hold those things up. It's just the muscles and that connective tissue. So um, they're very hardworking muscles. Um, and like we're going to learn a little bit later today, they are directly related to sexual function. So specifically, i uh, touched on this a little bit, but orgasm. So uh, in an orgasm is just a rhythmic contraction of those pelvic floor muscles. So that's pretty exciting. And as we'll learn a little bit later too, sometimes uh, muscle dysfunction there can lead to some pain during sex. So I'll bring it back to, to Rachel. Fantastic. Um, okay, so when we look at the vagina, the vulva, and the vestibule, I really separate this into three different areas. And a lot of us may think that our vagina is just this organ that sits in the middle of the body that like a penis or a dildo maybe goes into, maybe some fingers time to time, um, and that urine comes out of. And that is to an extent accurate, but there's so much more to it than that. So that's what I'm breaking down for you here. Um, to start, we have the mons pubis, right? That's just the area of fatty tissue that covers the organ it's a protective area. We have the clitoral hood, which is tissue that covers the clitoris, which is such an important component of sex, right? Um, I love the clitoris. Uh, we have the labia majora, which you can't see as well in this picture, but those are just areas of fatty tissue that are sort of outside a, a little bit more. And then we have the menorah that are inside. The majora are actually also protecting from any sort of infection that can happen. We have the urethra, which is where urine comes from. 
we have um and then we have the vaginal opening and if you look at that hole the vagin the vagina is actually inside of that hole so the vagina is a tubular structure that is the vagina a lot of us think i have patients come in all the time and say i'm having itching or burning or whatever and i always have to say is it external or is it internal because internal is the vagina the external part is called the vulva right? And then we have the vestibule. And this is my very favorite area. I love it so much that I blew it up for all of you. Um, but the vestibule goes from um, where if you see the line pointing toward heart's line, um, and it ends at sort of the hymen. And that area is rich. It is rich with estrogen receptors, with testosterone receptors, with nerve endings. And it's a key area where we can see pain, painful intercourse and, and various issues going on. So I'm always doing a solid thorough exam right there to, uh, to evaluate and see if there's any issue happening. And then I think now it's Dr. Campbell to talk about, yeah, causes of infection. Sure. Um, so let's talk about reasons for pain during sex. Um, I am going to just preface this by saying that this is by no means a comprehensive list of all the causes of painful intercourse. I unfortunately will not be able to, I don't have enough time to go through all of them, but I do, however, want to reiterate that if you are experiencing pain with intercourse, that it's important to speak to your OBGYN or healthcare provider to try and get down to the root cause because there are treatments available. Um, as I mentioned before, there are many different causes ranging from your own anatomy, the way in which your uterus lies within the pelvis, um, different pelvic pathology, women with endometriosis not only have pain with periods, but can have pain with intercourse, um, women with large fibroids, cysts on their ovaries, certain skin conditions that can affect the vulva region, um, postmenopausal women dealing with low estrogen levels have issues with vaginal atrophy, and this can make penetrative intercourse very painful. Um, in addition to that, psychosocial reasons, non-gynecologic reasons, the list goes on and on. And so instead of going through each and every each and every cause, I wanted to kind of touch upon some of the more common causes of painful sex that we frequently encounter in the office. Vaginitis is inflammation of the vagina, and this can be caused by either a fungal, a bacterial, or a viral infection, yeast infections, or sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea or chlamydia can cause local inflammation and edema within the vaginal tissue that, again, can make penetration very uncomfortable. Typically, Dr. Campbell, for, for those that don't know what edema is, can you explain a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and again, feel free to stop me. Sometimes I throw out some medical terminology that are common for me, but um, if you need to explain, more than happy to. Edema is essentially um, something that happens when inflammation occurs. It can cause swelling um, within the tissue. Um, it kind of draws in fluid from your body and can cause swelling. So as you can imagine, a vagina that's not only kind of angry and red and inflamed, in addition to being edematous and kind of fluid filled can be very uncomfortable. Um, as I was mentioning, typically these infections are associated with other symptoms such as abnormal discharge. Some women have bowel smelling discharge. It can cause burning within the vagina, increase itching. Herpes, which is a common sexually transmitted infection can cause genital blisters or sores that can be extremely painful, not only to touch, but also during intercourse. Um, some of these infections, if they're left undiagnosed and untreated, can lead to a chronic pelvic infection called PID or pelvic inflammatory disease, or it can pre precipitate other pelvic floor disorders that I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. Um, therefore, very important to seek care if you're experiencing any of these symptoms so that you prevent any of these complications from occurring. The treatment is varied um, and it depends on the type of infection. You may need an antifungal, an antibiotic, an antiviral, depending on the type of infection you have. Additionally, if you're diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection, it's also very important that you and your partner are adequately treated to prevent reinfection amongst yourselves. Um, other things, probiotic, boric acid are also great treatment options for those who are suffering from chronic vaginal infections. 
Um, if we want to go to the next slide, perfect. Um, another cause for pain with penetrative intercourse are disorders within the pelvic floor muscles that Anna kind of touched upon. Um, vaginismus is a disorder that involves essentially sudden, painful, involuntary contractions of the muscles within the vaginal area in response to either a sexual or non-sexual vaginal penetration, meaning simply inserting a tampon or undergoing a speculum exam during your pap smears can cause these muscles to spasm. So people with vaginismus experience the spasming of the pelvic muscles either with anticipation of penetration or during or after intercourse. Some people can describe a burning sensation as soon as you touch the outer area of the vagina. Other people can describe it as kind of sharp pain in the vagina, in the pelvis, or sometimes pain that can be referred into the abdomen. Um, so as you can see, vaginismus can be very distressing and can cause a lot of upset, upset and breakdown um, within a relationship. And for those who are trying to conceive, it can make it very difficult to have children. Um, the way in which vaginismus can present is sometimes during your first sexual inter encounter. Um, anxiety, nerves associated with engaging in, in sex for the very first time can make the pelvic muscles kind of tense up so severely that it feels like, you know, it's hitting a brick wall and it can be very painful. So as you can imagine, this can be very distressing to an individual, which can further worsen their anxiety and nerves with the next time they have sex. The more you experience this, this distress, the more the body responds by contracting and you unfortunately fall into this vicious cycle. Um, vaginismus does not just develop in people who are new to having sex. People who can experience a secondary onset where in the past, they've enjoyed penetrative sex, but develop vaginismus from either a chronic vaginal infection, which I had alluded to in the previous slide, after pelvic surgery, bladder surgery, bowel surgery, um, after sexual trauma, um, and even in response to any stresses in your daily lives or in your relationships. Um, on kind of the opposite spectrum, um, people can have issues with hypotonic or loose pelvic floor muscles. This can kind of present itself with essentially pelvic prolapse where the, either the uterus or, or the, the top of the vagina or the bladder or the bowel begin to prolapse or fall into the vagina and this bulge can make penetrative intercourse uncomfortable. Um, so in terms of these experiences with hyper or hypotonic pelvic floor muscles, they're very common and certainly treatable. Um, treatment options are quite varied and can involve medications like diazepam, which is essentially a, a benzo suppository um, that can help relax the vaginal muscles. This is certainly a great option for those um, who, uh, a great option, especially when used in anticipation of vaginal penetration to help relax the pelvic floor muscles and make sex more enjoyable. Um, the best thing that you can do for yourself if you suffer from vaginismus is to seek help from a pelvic floor or a therapist like Anna, who can help fix the underlying problem. Um, pelvic floor therapists are highly trained people who can help you learn more about your pelvic muscles and will teach you ways to kind of release the tension from those muscles. Typically during these evaluations, you, you undergo a very comprehensive examination where they help you identify the muscles that are involved. They will work with you in a hands-on manner and use biofeedback to help you teach, um, to help teach you and um, help relax those muscles. Um, during these exercises, sometimes vaginal dilators are used. Um, vaginal dilators essentially look like dildos, but they have varying sizes from very small to larger and larger, and they're slowly yes, introduced. to call them the Russian nesting dolls of dildos. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a very good analogy, yes. Um, the, the, um, the purpose of them is to slowly introduce them into the vagina so that um, you learn to relax and breathe, to release tension um, in those muscles to allow insertions to insertion of gradually larger dilators. Um, I 
am by no means an expert in this. So Anna, if you have anything more to add in terms of pelvic floor therapy um, in the setting of vaginosis, please, please feel free to. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's basically it. It's like, um, vaginosis is one of my favorite things to treat um, because it really is very treatable with just a combination of manual work that we do. So meaning uh, we work manually on the pelvic floor muscles vaginally. Uh, I usually just use like my one gloved finger with lube on it and we work on stretching the muscles and um, sort of like what Dr. Campbell says, there's like this cycle of pain and muscle spasm that keeps happening over and over again. And I always talk with my patients about how the pelvic floor has like a list of all of these negative experiences that it's had, you know, like having pain with sex every time you tried, having pain with inserting a tampon, having pain at the doctor's office. And so in its mind, it thinks like anything that goes in there is gonna be painful. So with PT, we try and break that cycle by giving it positive experiences, meaning like with the dilator, starting with something that's smaller and manageable that it can slowly and steadily start to learn and accept that, oh, okay, like this amount of stretch or this amount of like friction is okay. And then we move up in size until um, eventually you are able to have sex without pain again. So yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, you know, we can talk about all the different reasons why sex can be painful, but I think the most important thing that you can take from this lecture is that painful sex is not normal. Sex should be enjoyable for you and your partner. And if you are experiencing pain with sex, you really should seek care from either an OBGYN or a healthcare provider. You know, it's, it's very important for you to be your own advocate and to find a provider that you feel comfortable having these pretty intimate discussions with. So you should really look in, look at this as a sort of a journey between you and, and your provider in making sex more enjoyable for you. Um, and it's important to enter this journey with kind of an open mind um, and patience because, um, you know, unfortunately for some, the road to pain-free sex may take some time. And as, you know, we've discussed, it may require a very multidisciplinary approach. Okay, so this part's going to be fun. <laughs> um, Allison, if you want to go to the next slide. So this part of the lecture is, uh, or this, the topic is not, uh, I think we're all sort of aware. I just think that we forget these things, or maybe we didn't learn these things. I mean, one of the biggest issues when you talk about sexual health is that we don't do sex, like we don't learn how to have sex in school. Um, you know, we're learning how to prevent STDs. We're learning about birth control and never to get pregnant, but we're not learning about what a healthy sexual experience is for women. And I, I actually, I, I think that that can lead to other problems down the road, not just in sex, but in relationships and, and et cetera. So anyway, uh, there are lots of places where we can experience pleasure, right? Uh, I have a picture here of the G spot. I think some of us, maybe all of us know that we do have a G spot. It is most similar to the male prostate, which I think is fascinating. Um, it's two centimeters into the vaginal canal. So if you insert your fingers into the vaginal canal and you press upward, that's what we call the anterior part of the vaginal of the vagina. Um, so it's two centimeters into the anterior uh, vaginal opening. Um, and that is where the G spot is. We also have the clitoris that I spoke about earlier with the 8,000 nerve endings. Um, it is most similar to the male uh, penis, which is pretty awesome. Um, and a, a, an area where I think a lot of us are experiencing stimulation. What I think most of us maybe don't hear about or don't know that it's okay is that anal stimulation is fair game. The, you, there are nerve endings in that area. So if that's not something that's comfortable for you, that's completely fine. Um, but it's also a very safe space to do uh, in a way that feels good for you. Um, the nipples, people have been known to orgasm from stimulation to the nipples. And let's not forget about the erogenous zones that are throughout our body. All er erogenous zones are, 
our areas of pleasure. So we have the lips, we have behind the ears, we have between the thighs, all of these areas are pleasure centers. So if you think about all those ways we can tap into and get creative, sex can become a lot more interesting. And I think that we get into this mindset, especially in today, and I'm going to talk about this probably three different times, fight or flight, right? We're constantly going, we're thinking about what we need to do the next morning, the 15 things we need to do at work the next day. Like when are we going to have to have time to have sex? And when we're having sex, we're still thinking about those things. So some of us, I, I think can get into a mindset of like, okay, well, I know that if I'm stimulated at the clitoris, that's just going to do it for me. And then I'm going to have an orgasm and that's fine. That's cool. But if you want to expand on that and look at experiencing pleasure in these different areas, you can, you can stimulate different areas at the same time. You can have your G spot stimulated while you have the clitoris stimulated. And for those of you that are up for it, you can put on nipple clamps and experience stimulation in that area as well. Um, there's also technique, right? Like Maybe you're used to your partner stimulating you just from rubbing his or her finger around the clitoris over and over again. But maybe rather than doing that next time, you try rubbing the clitoris from the bottom to the top or doing it in a square or rubbing the clitoris at the bottom of the top while you're rubbing the opening of the vagina. Um, so, you know, just different ways of thinking about it. There's a really cool website that I think is really cool. I'll be honest. Some people may find it offensive, but it is women. I was telling my husband this and I was like, it's naked women. And he said, Rachel, you can't say it's naked women because they're only half naked, which is true. Um, but they are masturbating, but this is based on evidence-based research techniques, um, that show ways women can orgasm. Um, so it's, oh my God, yes.com. It's a hundred dollars, I think for the year to subscribe to it. And it just can help, um, bring in some creativity into the bedroom. And one thing I did I forget to mention all of my, all of my, um, the women in my family for Christmas this year. Uh, so it's the, be I'm so excited and to hear that. And, yeah. That's fantastic. It's like, I, I just learned about that website a few months ago and it was, it was very exciting for me. Um, so kudos to you. I forgot to mention also the best of you all, my favorite area um, many, many nerve endings, the hormone receptors in that area as well. That's a place where women can, can feel stimulation also. So if you are someone who gets stimulation just at that vaginal opening, that's very normal, um, and, and a good way to, to have sex. All right, next slide. Okay. So the next one is about meditation and mindfulness. And this is another one that is very simple, but I think we forget, uh, but we have solid research behind this. So we know that we are functioning in fight or flight mode basically every day, right? We're thinking about all the things we need to do and that affects sex. When we have sex, we are releasing hormones. We are releasing neurotransmitters and they are, they are stopping when we are constantly thinking, 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 going, going, going. So this is about tapping in, um, bringing our parasympathetic nervous system on board, um, and thinking about mindfulness every day, if you're able to do that, right. 10, five, 10 minutes a day, bringing that into your daily practice. And if not just really being in the moment with your partner, when you're having activity, right. And that's when we talk about the mental arousal, the cognitive arousal. So if your partner is touching your arm, if your partner is touching your, in your thigh, rather than thinking about what you need to make tomorrow morning, um, to get to work on time, think about what does your inner thigh feel like? Think about what does your partner's ha hand feel like, or your partner's tongue feel like on your vaginal opening? Those are all really important and they can change the game. So I mentioned here, different apps, Calm, Chopra, Headspace. These are not anything that we're getting paid for. There's also Inscape, which is an app, um, but finding a way to incorporate it into your daily is so, uh, such an effective way to um, maximize the sexual experience. Yeah, and I mean, I even learned I have a I have an overactive pelvic floor, and uh, that that meditation was like one way to actually practice relaxing it. So that you know, when I do want to have sex or or insert a tampon or whatever it might be, that that those muscles would be more relaxed, which was a big. I didn't realize the full connection between those two those two pieces. Wait, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Alice. I mean, one thing I do for almost every speculum exam is I have patients take a deep breath in and then I have them relax and relax their pelvic muscles toward the floor. And what I'm trying to incorporate into that as well, um, but I think it's it's uh, something a little bit more difficult to teach within a within a 
the moment that you're doing a speculum exam is really having patients breathe, like imagine a line going from your head to the pelvis, um, which I think takes more time and practice to really understand that connection. But that's a very real thing. Uh, and if you're able to really breathe into the pelvis and, and, and think about it in those terms, it can be helpful. All right. So my turn to talk about something fun. So um, this is, these three stretches are my favorites when I'm treating someone who has a more hypertonic pelvic floor or a tighter pelvic floor. Um, we have child's pose, happy baby, and a supported butterfly. Um, the thing all of these three things have in common are sort of like an opening of the pelvis as well as stretching like the inner thighs, which uh, connect very closely to the pelvic floor muscles. So it's sort of like if you can relax the inner thighs and the hips and the glutes, they can sort of also try to encourage the pelvic floor muscles to relax as well. Um, but just like what Rachel was saying, while I have my patients in these stretches, they're also practicing their diaphragmatic breathing and trying to relax and lengthen the pelvic floor muscles while they're in these positions too. So um, if you guys want to try it at home, you don't have to get in any of these stretches. You can just do it seated, but I want you to sort of put your attention down at your pelvic floor muscles. So they live again, sort of between the front of your pubic bone and your sacrum and between your two sit bones. I want you to try to imagine that as you're inhaling, those pelvic floor muscles are dropping and inflating like a balloon. And so you can try to take a big deep breath in, inflate your belly, and also imagine that you're inflating those pelvic floor muscles. Um, and so that is something that takes a little bit of work because it's tricky. We're taught all the time, like maybe we should just be kegeling, um, but instead trying to do the opposite and letting those muscles relax. And these positions also help those muscles to do that a little better. All right. And the most fun slide, but I'm a little biased. Um, we have a couple different sexual positions that my patients have found to be helpful. Um, and I do want to preface this by saying that every person is different. So what works for one person is not going to feel great for another person. Uh, these also are going to work differently for different people, depending on where you have your pain. So for example, if you have pain with more deeper penetration versus pain more at that vestibule area. So the first one that I feel like most of my patients do really well with is just being on top. So that's laying down or sitting. Basically, when you are on top, you are in control of the speed of the movement and the depth of penetration. So uh, therefore, you're not always kind of like worried that like, oh, maybe like my partner's penis or finger is going to go too deep. Like you are in charge of all of that. Um, the second one that I like a lot is spooning. So where you're both kind of laying on your side, facing the same direction. Uh, with this, your booty gives you a little bit of cushion, right? So this is especially good for someone who has pain with deeper penetration because uh, his penis is not going to be able to go in as far as it could in other positions. Um, the next one we have is when you're on bottom, but with some pillows underneath your butt so that it kind of changes the angle of your pelvis to be tilted a little more backwards. Uh, this allows for his penis to kind of enter and not maybe touch the bottom part of your vaginal canal. That might be a little bit painful. Um, and the last one is standing slightly bent forward. The picture is like a little intense. I would say probably not bent forward that much, but like at a countertop or like the back of a chair, back of the couch. And this is that same kind of booty cushion. Again, uh, he won't be able to penetrate as deep as in other positions. Um, and sort of like what Rachel was talking about before, if you cannot yet tolerate vaginal penetrative sex, there are so many other options um, to do before then. So I just had a resource slide here. Some of these things we've touched on, and I think Anna added a few at the bottom too, um, but the, the meditation app and the, oh my God, yes, I already talked about um, sex with Emily. She's pretty cool. She has her PhD in sex, human sexuality, I think, but she, 
she's really a, a personality too. And she's got a podcast and a website and, and does a lot of different interviews. And, and honestly, it's just changing the game when it comes to talking about sex, which I think is really important. Um, she has a lot of interesting conversation topics on her website and she's worth checking out just to sort of be expansive in the thinking. Sex therapists, uh, you can have your very own if you want one. They run about $200 an hour in the LA area, um, but they do submit uh, um, uh, receipts for reimbursement to insurance if you want to. Um, but it also is something that's really important for patients who are truly struggling with libido, with arousal, with pain, all of these things. Um, I'm constantly referring to sex therapists. Um, and I have a, a number of them on speed dial that I'm working closely with um, and, and, and referring patients to. Um, lubricants, I just mentioned a couple here that are not generally not going to cause infections. Uber lube, you can also put in your hair. Ooh, kind of fun, but slippery think stuff. Actually, think I think around uh, like what kinds of lubes are pregnancy safe? Yes, I think Dr. Campbell, you were going to tap into that one as well, right? Yeah, um, definitely. I could do that right now. Um, basically, there are essentially three types of lubes out there. They're oil-based, water-based, silicone-based. Um, kind of the gist in terms of what research has shown is that um, oil-based lubricants have the least impact on sperm motility and vitality. It, just, it appears that the silicone and water-based lubricants tend to have a more detrimental effect on, you know, how fast these sperm can swim and essentially can cause a lot of um, DNA damage and um, can kill some of the sperm um, if these lubricants are used. So there are actually a few kind of fertile friendly lubricants that I am aware of. Um, that don't have any harmful ingredients like silicone or petroleum. Um, the pH of these lubricants actually match the pH of semen and um, are sperm friendly. Um, the two that I um, have seen used the most, um, one is Preseed and the other is Conceive Plus. Um, the Conceive Plus um, has kind of an added benefit where they actually add magnesium and calcium. And the thought is that um, both those um, both those things can actually um, improve, actually, uh, I guess, help support sperm motility. Very cool. Oh, okay. So WeVibe and LeWand. Uh, WeVibe is, these are vibrators. So WeVibe is one that it, you can get clitoral stimulation and um, sort of G-spot stimulation at the same time. It's inserted externally and internally. It's like a little U-shape. And uh, you can also have it on while you're having sex, which is kind of fun. And then they want is a bigger one, but it's stimulate. It's just, it's very large, um, but, but it stimulates a lot of the receptors externally, which, which can be fun. And then intimate, I don't know if I put intimate rose or if you did Anna, but I don't know if you want to talk to it. Either. Yeah, I can, I can talk about it. Um, these are the picture up there of the eight dilators. Those are the intimate rose dilators. Um, there are lots and lots of different types of dilators out there. Um, we like intimate rose or soul source because they are silicone, which means they're like ben bendy and flexible um, and they have like a nicer texture on them. Um, they are on the pricier side because of that. So if cost is an issue, there are other dilators that are more rigid plastic ones that just, they do exactly the same thing. They're just not bendy. Um, and then the last picture down there is the O-Nut, which I love. It's really cool. It has, comes with three or four, I think of those little rings. And basically what you do, if you have pain with deep penetration is you have your partner wear a varying number of these rings so that it's like a physical stopper. So he can't penetrate back in where you have that pain. So a lot of my patients really like that. And because there's like three separate rings, like you can start with him wearing three of them. And then as you get better and better, like maybe he takes one off and one off and then eventually you don't need it anymore. So it's a really cool product. Awesome. And so the end, the takeaway points here are just that the pelvic, the vagina, the pelvic muscles, uh, everything is so interconnected as is the body mind connection, right? Just like everything else we hear about this a lot. Um, but it's really important to tap this into sexuality as well. And I think, 
you know, we tuck sex away. We don't have the conversation. We have pain and we don't talk about it or ask about it. We think that's our baseline. Maybe we've never been able to orgasm. Maybe we've never really felt like having sex and that's bothersome to us. Um, and if it's not bothersome, that's also fine. I mean, there's nothing to do about that, but if it is, I just, I want everyone to know there's a place to come to. There's a place to talk about these things. Um, as Dr. Campbell talked about, you know, the biggest thing I tell patients when they're coming into the office for these issues is like, this is the start of a journey together. Um, for some of these patients, it took them a long time to come and it can take some time to sort of figure out a resolution. I had a few people today where I said, look, we're going to do these two things first. And I know that those are patients I'm probably going to see again in two months. Um, and then we're going to need to add some things and some things may be solved and some things maybe need to be discussed again. So um, it's just about, you know, having that open mind that Dr. Campbell mentioned really being patient and knowing that if we work together, we can find a solution. Amazing. Uh, I learned a lot. I think we had a ton of Q&A, so I know we've had some just from the panelists, so I will just um, throw those to you all, and then we can go into our um, our archives of a lot of the other questions people submitted in advance. But we had one from a panel or a um, attendee who asked, said, I'd like to be on top, but it doesn't feel comfortable with some hip tightness. Any suggestions for accommodations to still try to have intercourse on top or any good stretches? Yes. So uh, any of those three stretches that I had in the slide earlier, so like a child's pose, but maybe even like a wider legged child's pose, um, happy baby for sure is a good one. Uh, and basically anything that's going to stretch your inner thigh muscles, because usually that's the culprit, right? When you're on top, you're sort of having to straddle. And so if your inner thigh muscles are tight and you're not able to get sort of as far down as you want to, it's going to be a little challenging. Um, another one that wasn't in the slide that's probably good for that, for tight hips in general, is like a figure four stretch. So crossing one ankle over your opposite knee. Um, that might also, that muscle might be affecting your ability to like get in a more comfortable position there. Um, but another thing you could try is instead of on the bed, I would suggest maybe like sitting on a couch so that way you don't have to like get down as far cool. try that awesome we had another question around is it possible to be allergic to someone's ejaculation sex always hurts or burns more if my partner ejaculates what would you all recommend dr campbell do you know that one? Ooh, um i don't you know, know that I, one I've i was gonna say before. i i have actually read about this um, where women can have an allergy to semen or ejaculation. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't, I'm sure there's a treatment out there, but I don't know off the top of my head what it is. Um, but it is in fact a medical condition. Um, Are we able, Allison, is there any way we're able to um, bring these answers to like, if we don't know? Can we find a way to contact people? And yeah, definitely. Yeah. The person who submitted that, if you either want to like uh, DM me on the side, I'm happy to make sure we give you an answer to that question. Yeah, we can find that out. Perfect. Um, and another question we had was, are there any vibrators you'd recommend that are more gentle? Um, should this, this person finds that the ones that she uses tend to be too strong. Anna, what do you have on that one? Or what, well, I guess my question to that would be, what specifically are you using? I don't know if anyone's comfortable saying that. <laughs> Any that are more gentle. I mean, I find the Wee Vibe to be gentle. Uh, I definitely wouldn't use the Lay Wand for that one. Um, there's another one that I like. I need to find it. That is good and a little bit less aggressive. I need to find what it's called. The Dame Z. So that one's just a smaller one and it and you just apply it sort of to the clitoris or to that vaginal, you know, the vaginal opening, that vestibule area, um, and it's stimulating those receptors. I think that's that's a fair, a fair one to give a try. Well, um, another question we had was uh, what are resources you'd recommend to learn about, about what arouses you? Um, just like how any, they have one or two things that they go to, but is interested to learn more about what else can be arousing. 
I think sex with Emily is a really good resource to look at for that. Um, I also think that the Oh My God Yes website is good. So arousal is more complicated. It, like I said before, it's it's looking at neurotransmitters. It's looking at hormones and all of these things need to really be working together um, for a good solid experience. And, and part of this is about just being open to different techniques um, to sort of get you stimulated and get you interested, right? Um, so I would start there and then, and, and see, and see what that does. Yeah. My other recommendation would be, um, there's a bunch of audio erotica apps like targeted to women now. So, um, the one that I really love is Dipsy, but there's also Rosie is another example. Um, and Dipsy is, is basically, they describe themselves as short, sexy podcasts. So you can search by like different, um, different themes, whether that's like being dominated or, uh, you know, like more gentle, or there's lots of different kind of varieties that you can, you can listen to that I've, I've, I've found to be really, really helpful. Um, another question we have, does a bowel, bad bowel movement affect your pelvic floor? You know, that's probably a good one for you. Uh, I guess I would have to ask them to clarify what bad means. Um, I guess if we're going on, well, Nothing is going to be like bad for your pelvic floor, but your pelvic floor is going to be like affected in some way, right? So like on one end of the spectrum, if you are constipated and you're constantly like straining, pushing to get stool out, um, that can lead to some issues down the line, like maybe a prolapse um, or just a like a poor coordination of like the sphincters opening uh, or basically like being closed when they're they should be open. Um, if you're talking about the other end of the spectrum, like maybe a looser stool, um, like a chronic looser stool, that in itself is not going to affect the pelvic floor muscles. But if you're constantly feeling like you're going to leak in that, in that way that you're like holding all the time, that could affect the pelvic floor muscles and kind of make them become a little bit more of that hypertonic side. Cool. Um, we had a couple of questions in advance around uh, anything related to painful sex after a hysterectomy or how you think about working around that. Sure. So, you know, after a hysterectomy, it's pretty uncommon if you um, did not have any pain prior to your hysterectomy to all of a sudden develop pain with intercourse. Um, however, you know, it is possible. Some of the causes could be depending on the indication for your hysterectomy. So say you um, had your uterus removed because you had really bad endometriosis. Sometimes there could be residual disease, even despite taking the uterus out. If there's some endometriosis left at the vaginal cuff or at the top of the vagina um, after it's enclosed, it can cause pain with intercourse. Um, the other thing that I also kind of talked about during when I was um, talking about vaginismus is um, women can develop secondary vaginismus from a surgery. So a hysterectomy, if you're going into a hysterectomy, knowing um, that, you know, you're undergoing the surgery and they're going to be suturing the vagina closed and you're worried about sex and have a lot of anxiety after your surgery, that can precipitate, you know, tensing of those pelvic floor muscles when you do engage in sex. Um, so that can contribute to um, pain after uh, a hysterectomy. Other more kind of rare things is, you know, there are a lot of nerve, uh, nerve groups and bundles that supply the pelvic floor. So after surgery, if any of those nerves are disrupted or um, entrapped into that vaginal cuff, um, it can actually cause some neuropathic pain, particularly um, on exam. If you touch the top of the vagina, it causes pain. And in those situations, people um, can be treated with either um, injecting, you know, lidocaine or even putting a topical lidocaine onto into the vagina to help with with um, with pain. Um, and then other things that I can think of, um, just you know, post-surgically wise is that anytime you have surgery, um, people can develop adhesions within the pelvis. So um, development of really bad scar tissue in there um, can kind of um, cause the vagina to be trapped or kind of configured in a way that might make sex more uncomfortable. 
Cool. Uh, we had a question around uh, the my hormonal cycle drastically affects my arousal ability. Um, what resources are what for understanding what hormones might be might need adjusting, or are there any natural ways to go about that? So that's a tricky one. Uh, we do see in women of reproductive age at times they can have the, there, you know, we have the drop off of estrogen and progesterone right before, um, menses. And so that can lead to vaginal dryness, different symptoms. I actually had a patient today who was having vaginal burning prior to, prior to her period. And she's probably in her twenties. It's not going to do anything to draw hormones that won't give me any information. Um, and it's a waste of your money to do that. So sometimes we will try doing vaginal estrogens to uh, sort of see if it, if it helps. And we do see benefit from that. Um, the patient today, actually, I may look at taking her, she was on an IUD and which is, is, is sort of a local birth control. And then we've switched to a, a birth control pill, which is a whole other can of worms and sexual health. Um, but, uh, I think that's a hormonal issue in its own way. And we may have to do some experimenting with taking her on and off. And what I'm doing right now is I just have her on like a B6, um, gel called replens. That's going to help bring moisture into the area. I think the bottom line answer to that question is we really have to take it as a case by case basis, see what is going to work specifically for the patient, see what the patterns are, who are her partners, when are these things happening? Um, uh, and, and, and try to make a plan from there. Awesome. Uh, a question that this is probably for you, Dr. Campbell, but what treatment do you recommend for bacterial vaginosis? Should you not use a dilator when you have it? Sure. Um, so kind of the first line treatment for BV or bacterial vaginosis is flagell. So it's a medication that, you know, you'll take twice a day for, you know, a week. Um, for the most part, it's a very effective medication. Once you take it, it you, majority of the time will clear the infection. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question was, is, uh, should you not use a dilator when you have bacterial vaginosis? Like a vaginal dilator? Um, you know, I, I don't think it would be contraindicated. I mean, I think it would be okay as long as you, one, you're not sharing dilators because BV can be passed, um, um, amongst users, but, um, the dilator in itself is not going to either precipitate or prolong your, your vaginal infection. Cool. Uh, so the other, the ahead. other thing about BV is that it can, and Dr. Campbell, I think spoke to it a little bit in, in the presentation as well, but it can be recurrent, right? So we see these things and they kind of resolve themselves and we treat them and they go away and it's fine. And when they're happening, I mean, it's, it's, we have bacteria, right? We have lactobacilli in the vagina that keep the area nice and acidic and those can get thrown off from different things, from sex, from your period. Um, and in theory, like anything external could exacerbate it, but a dilator is not really going to throw it off too, too badly. You have to kind of think about like, what is the, what is the risk? And ultimately the risk isn't that serious. Um, but the other thing to consider is just that they can continue happening over and over and over again. Um, and so for some patients, it's not really a big deal. Like they get treated and then it goes away and that's fine. And that's the end of it. But when it becomes an issue where it's happening again and again and again, the evidence is there for treat treatment of recurrent infections, but it's also mixed. Um, and so that's something where we have to try different things for patients. Um, and it can be a frustrating experience. And I really tell, we have a lot of patients call into the office because they know their bodies and they want medications and treatment over the phone. And sometimes we can do that, but in those patients, I am telling them to come into the office. Let's do cultures. Let's figure out what's actually happening because sometimes these can manifest in different ways. Um, so I just thought that was an important plug to do there because it is a, a common, um, there's a, it's a really, really common infection. And then there's a lot of different ideas that patients have about what it means to treat or what it means to, means to handle it. So I'll have patients who are really frustrated and then I'll have patients who are like, oh, I had this once and it, and then that was the end of it. Cool. Um, I, this is a question I'm curious about the answer for, which is, can the G spot be reached through the anus? That is a question I don't know the answer to. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. 
Um, I, I mean, I think that the nerve endings are all interconnected, the muscular, the muscles are all interconnected. And so in theory, you could probably get some stimulation in that area. I mean, it's all individualized when it comes to that, but the, the, I don't think that that's something that's going to be specifically studied either. Cool. Um, at what point would you all recommend sex therapy? Does anybody else want to take it? I can take it if Anna, either way. I mean, I, um, I just recommend it a lot in general. <laughs> so, but specifically for patients who have that like really high anxiety about it, where it's a lot like, I mean, a lot of times it's a lot more than just the physical things happening. There's a lot of stuff mentally and emotionally that are happening. Um, so that's why I recommend it a lot, but, um, especially if it's, you know, if it's going really well on like the physical therapy part, but they're still having that like very negative, like fight or flight um, associations with it, then I will push harder for it. <laughs> the other thing that's really important to remember to consider this presentation tonight specifically is not about libido um, or arousal, which is like a whole presentation in itself. But uh, that libido especially is tricky. Um, as far as like researched treatments that we really truly have, and we do have some, they exist, but I wish we had more. Um, but I've mentioned a few times, you know, there are neurotransmitters involved. There are hormones involved in this process for people. Um, it really is about, you know, what your baseline is. And so, sex therapy can be a really important place to start. Unfortunately for women, when we look at low desire, uh, we have one FDA approved, well, no, two now, I guess, two FDA approved treatments for women. Um, but sex therapy and meditation is like number one. I mean, that's just a great, and, and there, and it's one of those things that, you know, people maybe don't know that they haven't tapped into it until they don't know that they haven't tapped into it. Like we just have to kind of send them and, and see how things go. Well, um, can the copper IUD be correlated with chronic vaginal pain, specifically with sex? Sure. Potentially. I mean, Dr. Campbell, do you want to take it or do you want me? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It, it, well, I agree. It could potentially be. It's definitely um, something that we consider when someone comes in and they have an IUD and all of a sudden or they had an IUD placed. Um, and all of a sudden they're now having either pelvic pain or pain with intercourse. I don't think um, having a copper IUD in itself, I think an IUD, whether it's a Mirena or a copper IUD um, is certainly something that we, you know, may consider um, as, a, as a potential cause for or pelvic pain during sex. Great. It's one of those things where, you know, there's something called perforation, which is when the IUD could potentially poke a hole through the uterus. Um, it's rare. It's going to happen at insertion if it happens. Um, but, or the IUD can potentially expel, right. Where it just kind of comes out again, something rare, but common. So if a patient calls and she's having painful sex, all of a sudden, that's definitely something we want to rule out. It's not the first thing. It's not something we're going to see commonly, but it's definitely a thing that could be going on for sure. Well, cool. I know we just have one more minute left, so I will get our last question in, which is around what insurance does women's care take? Oh, my Lanta. I wish I knew all the billing. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, do you know? Okay. Have they told I us? was going to say, I, I feel like you know better than I, because I haven't <laughs> officially office. started yet. <laughs> Call the office and find out the answer to that question. Um, I have no idea. I mean, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I know that one. Yeah. And United, I think. Probably and about, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you, if you, if you call the office, you can figure it out. Um, well, thank you everyone. This has been so, I have learned so much. This has been super helpful. Um, I think to your point, Rachel, pain with sex and how to actually maximize pleasure is something that we just don't talk about enough. Um, my favorite stat that I've learned since working at origin is that, well, very disappointing, but just interesting is that there are five times the amount of studies around male pleasure as there are for female pain with sex. And so I think that it just speaks to you know, the changes that we have to make through conversations like this. So really grateful for everyone for joining us tonight. Hopefully you learned something helpful. Um, and we will, like I said, send out the video of this after um, probably early tomorrow. But thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Campbell, Anna and Rachel. Really appreciate it all. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.